Uh, so good to be with you all tonight. Uh, can I ask Aiden and Chris to grab the pulpit? It's kind of buried. Oh, they already did. <gasps> Sorry, guys, you've been dethroned by the junior hires. They said, we are going to be the finest in all the land. Yeah. Uh, yes, Braden and the team were on it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, good to worship with you, hang out with you. Really enjoyed the conversation with some of you guys beforehand. braden has been thinking all the, all the big brain thoughts this evening. So it has been good. You guys doing all right? Yes, good. We're alive. We're here. Luke's doing well. Um, glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Well, um, if Jacob can bring me my clicker when he gets a chance, um, but there's no crazy rush on it. I'm so glad you guys are here. It has been a good week in the Brondike household. It has been a crazy week in the Brondike household, and possibly for no good reason, I just feel super duper tired. So I don't know if anybody getting, getting that vibe, feeling like you're ready for summer? Yes. Okay. We are ready for the school year. We only a few weeks left. You have almost made it. Congratulations. Um, you have almost completed another year of your academic schedule. So, um, good stuff. I encourage you, get out your Bible with us this evening. Um, we are going to be looking at the book of Zephaniah. Um, just a tip, if you open up ProPresenter and make sure that you cancel out and that's not broadcasting anything, because that could prevent you from getting the PowerPoint. If you don't know what I mean, I'd be happy to come back and show you. Um, I'm going to come back and look at it really quick. Um, we have so much to be thankful for in our ministry here. So many people that volunteer and help us out. So, um, ooh, it looks like it froze. Yeah. Oh. I'll put it off. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Nice. Sorry, everyone. Prober down there. Everything is going according to plan. Yeah. Everything is working. Hey, we're up. Congratulations. All right. So we are so grateful for our tech guys. They are dealing with some particular challenges tonight as the Corwins had some other responsibilities. And thank you guys. Good job getting that all squared away for us. So what we've been looking at these last couple weeks has been the book of Zephaniah. So as we get geared up for it, we are um, excited to be together in this and um, excited for you to be with us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help and we'll dive right in. All right. Father. Um, we come before you now. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for you. I'm blessed by you and by your word. Um, Lord, I'm in, I'm in need of you, of your strength, of your help. Lord, um, these students, I thank you so much for each and every one of them that chose to be here tonight, God. We pray that you would uh, meet us in a special way. Help us, Lord, this evening as we gather, Lord, that you would speak to us from your word, that you would be pleased. Um, with our offering of, of worship, of adoration to you, we've worshiped you in song and, and in fellowship, but now we turn our attention to sit under the teaching of your word and try to understand better the words of your prophet Zephaniah. So, Lord, we ask for your help in that. We ask for you to speak to every heart here tonight, and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so um, hopefully you are getting a little bit better um, well-versed in the minor prophets that we've been looking at. Nothing minor about them, as I like to say, because I have officially embraced dad jokes. But we've been, I know, it's great, it's great. No, but so the minor prophets are those in the Old Testament that are just shorter in length. So the Old Testament is arranged in such a way, it starts out with the Pentateuch, goes on to the books of histories, the books of poetries, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. So if you're having a hard time finding Zephaniah, he's there towards the end of the book uh, of the Old Testament. So, what we looked at last week is we introduced what was going on. Who was Zephaniah and when was he living? We looked at how he was a prophet in the end of the kingdom of Judea, how his prophecy could be summed up in the day of the Lord is near, how he was ministering primarily to the kingdom of Judah, the southern half of the kingdom of Israel, that had become rebellious even on after the failed attempt or revival under King Josiah. They... Um, continued to follow after idols, and God was proclaiming that his judgment was going to visit upon them as well. Um, the people had become so accustomed to not worshiping Yahweh, but worshiping um, Baals, other false gods, that God said, I've had enough, I will visit my day upon you. Um, this day is described in what we were looking at last week um, about this judgment coming upon Israel, this unmaking of the land, how God's wrath is going to be poured out and they're going to be unmade. The cities will be torn down and laid bare. And it's clear from history, this apocalyptic language that's going on too, is talking about the soon coming conquest of the Babylonian empire that would ultimately conquer the southern kingdom of Judah, just as another nation had conquered the northern kingdom of Israel years earlier. 
As we got to the end, there was kind of this, okay, this, this terrible thing is coming. You have sinned. God is right in his anger against you. What is one to do? And the, uh, the prophet Zephaniah says very clearly to those that are willing to listen, he says, you need to seek the Lord while he may be found. Those who are humble in the land, he says, there's a hope that even in God's coming judgment, that he's going to save for himself a remnant of his people, that he's going to do something good with in the earth. So um, that's our, our hope and the hope of the people in Zephaniah's day, that God might save for himself a remnant. So that got us all the way through uh, chapter 2, verse 3. So tonight, we're going to be picking up where we left off, starting in chapter 2, verse 4, and we're going to be reading about God's ongoing prediction of uh, condemnation, of coming judgment. So far, he's talked about how his day is going to visit upon Israel, how it is going to visit Judah, and he kind of widens the scope and said, hey, the wickedness that I've seen here, I've seen elsewhere as well. And we're going to see how Zephaniah starts to pronounce judgments, not just on the people of Israel, but on all the nations of the earth. So that's where we're directing our focus now as we start this next portion of the next chapter. We're going to look at how the judgment of God is prophesied for coming against all nations of the earth. So I encourage you, look in your own copy of the Bible in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4, and stand with me as we look at this portion of Scripture as Zephaniah prophesies the coming judgment against all of the people of the earth. So Zephaniah 2, verse 4, it reads, For Gaza will be abandoned. Ashkelon will become a ruin. Ashdod will be driven out at noon, and Ekron will be uprooted. Woe, inhabitants of the seacoast, nation of the Chatharites. Woe to the, the word of the Lord is against you. Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will destroy you until there is no one left. The seacoast will become pasture land, and the caves for shepherds and folds of sheep. The coastland will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah. They will find pasture there. They will lie down in the evening among the houses of Ashkelon, for the Lord their God will return to them and restore their fortunes. I have heard the taunting of Moab and the insults of the Ammonites who have taunted my people and threatened their territory. Therefore, as I live, this is a declaration of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Moab will be like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place overgrown with weeds, a salt pit, and a perpetual wasteland. The remnant of my people will plunder them and the remainder of my nation will dispose of them. This is what they get for their pride because they have taunted and acted arrogantly against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrifying to them, and he will starve all the gods of the earth, and all the distant coastlands of the nations will bow down to worship him, each in his own place. You Cushites, you will be slain by my sword. He will also stretch out his hand against the north. He will destroy Assyria. He will make Nineveh a desolate ruin, dry as the desert. Herds will lie down in the middle of every kind of wild animal. Both the desert owl and the screech owl will roost in the capital of its pillars. Their calls will sound for the wi <clears throat> from the window, but devastation will be on the threshold. He will expose their cedar work, the cedar work. This is the self-assured city that lives in security, that thinks to herself, I exist and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become, a place for wild animals to lie down. Everyone who passes by here jeers and shakes his fist. Thus saith the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So here we see God's ongoing prophesied judgment against the nations through the prophet Zephaniah. We've looked at the wickedness of Israel, and now they shift their focus. First he speaks of a judgment... Ooh, I pushed a button, guys. I think it was my fault. I apologize. Um, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. First we speak about the... Uh, against the Philistines. If you look in your um, book there, you'll see in verses 4 through 7 that specifically Zephaniah is prophesying against these, the Philistines. These are the same Philistines from the Old Testament, from the story of David and Goliath. They have perpetually been a people that have been a thorn in the foot of the people of God. They were in the land when the Israelites first came there. They were told to drive them all out. They didn't, and they continue to be an issue for them. So if you look in verses 4 and 5, we see Zephaniah pointing to all of the people of the Philistines who live to the west and saying, you will be conquered. There is a coming judgment against you. He looks at Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Ekron are four cities along the coast of the Philistines. And he says, this is going to be a day of judgment for you as well. We look at his declaration of judgment against them in verses six and seven, and we look at what's going to happen. They were a seacoast land, so they were very wealthy, and they were very proud and very profitable from having seaports. And they built these large cities that, from which they had mocked God and worshipped false gods. And he says, your prominent cities will be destroyed. 
That's why he says these seacoast towns, all those towns that he just names, they'll become pasture lands. These cities that were once full will become caves for shepherds and their sheep to live and dwell in. He says the coastlands will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah. So he says what's going to happen to the Philistines is God is going to judge them. He's going to destroy their prominent cities, and he will eliminate the Philistines from the earth because they have rebelled against God. And it's interesting, each of these prophecies kind of comes with a little bit of a bright side. He says, well, I guess it's bright depending on who you are. He says, your wealth that you have taken, I'm going to give it to my people. I'm going to give the coastlands that you have inhabited to the people of Judah. If you want to learn more about all of these people that we're looking at tonight, you really do need to familiarize yourself with the whole of the scriptures, which we can't do for you tonight. But it was the Philistines that uh, afflicted the people of God and were wicked to them. These are all nations with their own gods who have risen up and said, we do not want to worship the true God of Israel. We will have our own way. They were constantly um, full of different wicked acts. And you can read about their, why these judgments are coming across them all over the scriptures. Um, looking back down in your Bible, when we shift our focus, first we had the Philistines and all their seacoastal cities. Now we look inland a little bit, and we look to the east to where the Moabites and the Ammonites live. And in verse 8, he says this, I have heard the taunting of Moab and the insults of the Ammonites who have taunted my people and threatened their, ter- their territory. What happened was the people of these nations had mocked the people of God. And um, though we realize when looking at this book that God does keep an account and he even deals with his own kids, they don't stop being his kids. And God says, hey, you can't just mess with my kids. I've seen, I heard, I heard what you said, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it right. I'm going to do something about this. He goes, I won't just let you go on mocking my people. I won't let you go on keep on harming them. Look at verse 9. He says, therefore, as I live, this is the declaration of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Moab will be like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah. What are they talking about there? In the Old Testament, there was a land um, that kind of became famous for its wickedness, where Abraham and Lot had some interactions there. The land of Sodom and Gomorrah was so wicked that there could not be found just a handful of of righteous people in it. There were people there that came and um, rather than practicing hospitality like they should have, the men of the city wanted to do wicked things to these angels of the Lord that were sent to the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. So God said, I'm going to punish this land. And we read the account of this in the book of Genesis, how God punished Sodom and Gomorrah with fire from heaven. And it was associated with fire, brimstone, and salt were the different things that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, to you Moabites and Ammonites, it will be like it was for Sodom and, like it was for Sodom and Gomorrah, it will be for you. It says that their cities will be overgrown and infertile. Um, it speaks of their, um, their land becoming a salt pit. This land that used to be fertile, God's going to deal with it in such a way. If, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like salting the earth. If the soil becomes too salty, it can no longer produce fruit and, and yield its crops. So he's saying, hey, I'm going to make it so that no one else can thrive here because you can't just go against me like that. You can't go against my people. He goes down and he says, I will be terrifying to you and I will starve the gods of the earth. All of these people, rather than giving God the worship that he would do, would worship gods that they would imagine in their own mind, gods of the harvest, gods of the sun, gods of the rain, and all of these different things that they hoped for. So God says, I'm going to show you that those gods have no power. I'm going to take what you think you're getting from them. I'm no longer going to give. I will starve the gods of the earth. Here he says, the bright side, again, my people, the people that side with me, they will plunder you. They'll have your wealth. And all the coastland nations will bow down to the true God of Israel. He prophesies this in the coming day of the Lord. If you look in verse 12, he directs his attention to the south. In the NASB, they um, translate this, um, the Ethiopians. He looks down and says just to them briefly um, that Ethiopia is included in this prophesied destruction. Um, some translations will translate it Kushites, but it's referring to that people that are in the north part of uh, the land of Egypt, the e- Ethiopia there. It says, you Kushites will also be slain by my sword. An interesting thing as we're surveying all of this, so far uh, Zephaniah has said, Israel, I'm going to judge you, but over there I'm going to judge them too to the west. Over here to the east, I'm going to judge them as well. And down in the south, yeah, I'm going to judge them as well. I haven't missed any of the wickedness going on around you. And he says something somewhat interesting. He says, hey, my sword is going to come against these lands. Now, Bible nerds, what is the coming destruction for these lands? Does anyone remember or does anyone know history? Yes? Yeah, Babylon. Do you know anything about Babylon? 
They're very powerful. Anything else about Babylon? Okay, yeah, there's some different eras of the history of Babylon. Okay, it's a, it's a, they come up a bit in, uh, Dylan knows all the things about Babylon. They, generally speaking, these were not nice people. The Bible doesn't have a lot good to say about Babylon. But how does God describe the army of Babylon here in this verse? It's kind of interesting. Verse 12. He, he says to the Ethiopians, you'll be slain by my sword, probably referring to the army of Babylon. This is something, if we're going to have to think of this rightly, we do need to understand that God sits enthroned in heaven as a judge of the nations of the earth. And sometimes, more than once throughout history, God is able to use people to judge people. And sometimes that is what he is doing in these international conflicts. This is what is what's happening here in this particular incident. He said, Ethiopia, I've seen your wickedness, and so I'm going to bring my sword, namely Babylon here, against you. Interesting to note. And we go one more direction, and it is the one on the map that we have missed. So we've gone west, we've gone east, we've gone south, we go north. We say to the Assyrians, those people leading to the north of uh, Judah, you too will be judged by God. He says, I will stretch out my hand against the north and destroy Assyria. Nineveh was their capital, and I said, I will make that capital a desolate ruin, dry as the desert. It speaks of what's going to happen to this city and saying in the capital, it's going to become a place for wild animals to live. That your capital building will no longer stand in defiance of God, but every animal uh, from the world will come and make its nest because it's speaking of this ruin. I don't know if you guys have ever seen I Am Legend. I don't know if I officially um, even recommend the film, but it's this kind of weird dystopian future where there's like, an, uh, like deer galloping through New York City because this place has become so desolate. There's also zombies because, of course, there is. Um, but in, it's saying in Assyria, in Nineveh, it's going to be kind of like that. It's going to be overgrown. There's going to be wild animals roaming the streets because God will not ignore them forever. It's interesting. He goes down and he says, the reason that I'm judging you, he says, they were a presumptuous city. They say something interesting. They say, I am, and there is no one beside me. This city sits up in its power and its pride and thinks, man, who could ever judge us? We're Assyria. We're Nineveh. We're the biggest global power that has ever existed, ever will exist. Who could ever stand beside me? It's interesting, they even use that phrase, I am, which is the name of God. And I think the prophet might be doing something there. They're saying, I am. There's no one else. He says, you, I'm going to tear you down. Now, there's a lot of people throughout history that have assumed when God's not keeping record of wrong, God's not going to bring us down. We can ignore the true God in heaven and turn out all right. But the author here does something kind of interesting. I don't, have any of you guys ever seen a map? You guys ever seen a compass? What are, the, what are the principal directions on this map? Oh, yeah, it's like, it's almost as if he's like, hey, in all of the directions, all of the people, yes, I've seen them too. I'm keeping record there too. And I'm going to visit my justice on all of these people. I think this is something that we feel sometimes. We uh, wonder if there's really someone in charge on the world stage. I had a professor in college that said it this way, and I liked it because it rhymed, it sticks in your head. He said, God is large and in charge. He is keeping track of the nations of the earth, and none of the nations of the earth get away with anything. God sees, knows, and understands, and there is a day where God will visit the earth and stand as judge in judgment of all of the earth. He says to the people of that day, he names, calls them all out and says, yes, I am coming to visit you as well as my people. It's interesting, there's one more people that he wants to call out here that we're going to consider. And he um, turns, almost treating them as one of these foreign lands, and he talks about Judah. He talks about his own people. He's saying, hey, the people that were supposed to be mine, they're not living like they're mine, and my judgment will come across them again. Look, you can look in your Bible in verse 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 tonight. That's the final text that we're going to look at. But I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we read this portion of the Word of God as well. So Zephaniah 3, 1 through 8. May God bless the reading of His Word. Woe to the city that is rebellious and defiled, the oppressive city. She has not obeyed. She has not accepted discipline. She has not trusted in Yahweh. She has not drawn near to her God. The princes within her are roaring lions. The judges are wolves of the night, which leave for nothing in the morning. 
Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary. They do violence to instruction. The righteous Lord is in her. He does no wrong. He applies his justice morning by morning. He does not fail at dawn. Yet the one who does wrong knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are destroyed. I have laid waste their streets with no one to pass through. Their cities lie devastated. Without a person, without an inhabitant, I thought you will certainly fear me and accept correction. Then her dwelling place will not be cut off based on all I have allocated to her. However, they become more corrupt in all their actions. Therefore, wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration until the day I rise up for plunder. For my decision is to gather nations and assemble kingdoms in order to pour out my indignation on them, all my burning anger, for the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. So here it's kind of interesting what he does. He identifies Israel and Jerusalem specifically. He doesn't call them by name, but as you read down, you can tell that the the God of this city is Yahweh, but they aren't acknowledging them as they should. These first couple verses, he describes the city of God and says, these are a disobedient people. They don't accept discipline. They don't trust in Yahweh. They don't draw near to God like they should. So what does he say? The reasons for their coming judgment? Their rebellion. The way that they've defiled um, God and His people. The fact that they've been oppressive and disobedient. They refused to be disciplined. Rather than loving the Lord's correction, they said, no, I will not go. No, I will not let God lead me. They didn't trust the Lord. They didn't approach God. And they had corrupt leaders. Thing after thing after thing where people should be doing the right thing, they are not. And God says, yes, I see. And yes, I care. And yes, I will judge in my house as well. There's an interesting uh, phrase in the Bible that's been bouncing around my head a lot. It says, let judgment begin and let it begin in the house of the Lord. That yes, God is going to be just and he is going to visit the earth in, in, in accordance with his justice. And he's not just going to overlook Judah because they're God's chosen people. And he's not just going to overlook us because we happen to be at church on a Wednesday. He says, I care when people ignore me and I see Next, he talks about the people who are in this land, and he contrasts himself with their wicked leaders. Look what he says of their leaders down in your Bibles. He um, speaks of them starting in verse 3. He says, their leaders are like lions and their judges are like wolves. I don't uh, know if any of you have been um, following some of the the recent court cases that have been famous and on TV. There's just been a lot going on in the world. Um, But man, we, we want justice, right? And if you were going to stand your day in court and you were going, someone said to you, oh man, your judge, man, he, that, that guy, he's a wolf. You'd be like, uh, that's not the attribute I'm looking for. He compares these people who are supposed to be establishing justice, be the leaders and be the judges to lions and wolves and not even like good ones. He says, he kind of paints, I don't know, you guys have seen Lion King when the, when the hyenas have been in charge in the pride lands for too long and there's just nothing left not even a bone to gnaw on because they have just devoured everything. He says, that's what your people are like. This is what your leaders are like. They're like lions and wolves who are devoured and consumed and there's nothing left. So of course, God is going to judge. He speaks of the prophet and says, these prophets, people who are supposed to stand and say, thus saith the Lord, here's the truth about God. Rather than doing that, they become insolent and treacherous men. He says the priests who are supposed to come before God and help make the people's relationship with God better and good, they profane the sanctuary with their offerings. It's almost as if he says, hey, you know, I know you're trying to do this worshiping of me thing, but you're doing it so wrong. You're doing it with such wickedness. I wish you would have rather just stayed home because I don't want that kind of offering. God is really frustrated with his people. I feel this as well. I I resonate with this. There are people, there have always been prophets who are willing to lie and say whatever they think people want to hear rather than accurately representing God. You guys better believe it's still a thing today. That there are people that will lie to you and be like, no, God doesn't care about. Oh, God, it's not really a big deal. God's not mad about. And they twist and invent their own idea of God and just tell you that you're okay. There are people on bestseller lists that'll do this to you. There's people that go to places called churches that I wonder if God feels the same way. I wish you would have rather just stayed home. You've made it worse. You've profaned what's supposed to be a house of God. 
It says that these people in their wickedness and the way that they've mishandled and misrepresented God, the way that he phrases it is you've done violence to the law of God. You have assaulted God's good command by so misrepresenting him, Judah. You haven't known me. You haven't worshipped me properly. You haven't represented me properly to the world. And I am upset. But here he compares to these himself. He says, but the Lord is there and he's in their midst. He's still in Judah and he doesn't do anything wrong. He applies justice morning by morning. He does not fail at dawn and he does no wrong. Even though the people of the Lord have done wickedly, God is still righteous. Sometimes the thing that upsets me, just breaks my heart most, is when someone who claims God represents him poorly. And I think that's something that God, I think God hated what the princes, the kings, the judges, the priests, and uh, the prophets in Israel were doing at this time. I think he hated it. And I hate it too. I think it's good to know what God loves and knows what God hates and feel the same way. And When people who are supposed to represent God instead abuse the people of God and misrepresent him and lie about what God says, God gets ticked. And God says, I see that, but, but don't get it twisted. I haven't changed. The people that said they were representing me, they did some wicked, twisted things, but that's not me. I stand in heaven and I've never done anything wrong. And that's how the Lord speaks here. He says, even though the people of the Lord have done wickedly, God is still righteous. So many people will abandon the faith because, well, I met a Christian that was a jerk. It's like, okay, well, that Christian was a jerk or maybe just not even a Christian. But you're judging, God didn't do something to you. Someone who's a person, who's a wicked person even, who God will judge, did something to you. What did God do for you? He made you. He loved you. He saved you. He sent Jesus. Don't let the shortcomings of people keep you from seeing clearly the God who is in heaven. Remember, he says, I'm a God. I've never done injustice. I bring justice to light. I don't fail. And I have eliminated nations, he says. And he says this as a good thing. There are some nations that shouldn't exist anymore. There are some times you've done enough wickedness and God says, hey, enough, the best thing for the planet is for this group of people to no longer do it in this way. This is the God of the Bible. And he declares his judgment over the nations of the earth. He says, specifically, we're looking in verse 7 and verse 8 of chapter 3. He says what he's going to do to the nations. He says, specifically speaking of Judah, he says, I thought you will certainly fear me and accept correction, and then her dwelling place will not be cut off. He's saying, hey, I was willing to draw you into myself, Judah. I was willing to make you my people. And based on all that I've given you, I thought we were going to have this. But you have become so corrupt, you've desired to corrupt all of your actions. Therefore, he says to even Judah, wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration until the day I rise up for plunder. God is not slack. He is not blind. He is not wicked. He is not unjust. He is not impartial to wickedness. It matters to him. And God is patient and long-suffering and kind, but someday he will say, enough is enough. I'm getting up. We always knew um, there was a line we didn't want to cross, and that was when Dad got up out of his chair to deal with us. We were like, okay, we'll play the games, play the games. But when Dad gets up, we're like, oh, no, we done, we done, we done gone too far. And this is kind of what he's saying. He's saying, hey, uh, okay, wait for it. I'm going to rise up for plunder. My decision is to gather the nations of the world together, to establish kingdoms together in order to pour out my indignation on them, all my burning anger. For the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. So God says, I am going to not just be the judge of Israel. I'm going to be the judge of the whole earth. Last week we looked at, man, in idolatry, we sometimes get it twisted. We sometimes think, well, no one's getting hurt, but we forget about God. I I spoke about how, imagine how upset Rachel would be if on the day of our anniversary, I gave so many gifts to another woman. Now, which of the people of the earth did God not create? He created all peoples. He rightly judges all lands and all people owe him the worship that is due his name. And he's saying, on the last day, I'm going to gather up all people from all area. And God is frustrated about sin. If you want a bonus verse, just write down Psalm 7, verse 11. Something I've been thinking about. God is not indifferent towards wickedness. It says God is angry with the wicked every day. 
God is good and he's not blind to the things that are going on in the earth that need to be judged. It says God will judge rightly and he is angry with the wicked every day. He says all the earth will be devoured by the fire of his zeal. And it doesn't matter if a nation believes in Allah, Krishna, Buddha, if it's a nation of atheists, if they believe in karma. God says, I made these people. I should have been their God. I've made myself available to them. I've cried out to them from creation, from my people. And someday he will judge the earth. So this day of the Lord is not something that we talk about a lot. But it is something that we've been talking about a lot the last couple of weeks. And something that I want you to feel and believe in your heart of hearts, that the day of the Lord is a good thing. Uh, We're going to watch a little video here to just give us a kind of survey of this concept in the Bible. And then we're going to revisit quickly as we close and consider this, why is the day of the Lord good? It's a phrase in the Bible that religious people use, usually when talking about the end of the world. Yeah, things like Armageddon or the apocalypse. You might be familiar with this image of Jesus returning on a white horse. He's got a sword to bring final judgment. And everyone wants to know, how will it all go down? So a lot of these images come from the last book of the Bible. But to understand them, you have to go back to the first book. When the story begins, we watch God create an amazing world. And then he gives humans power to rule over it on his behalf. But humans are tempted by this mysterious, unhuman character who offers them a promise. You could define good and evil on your own terms and put yourselves in God's place. Which is what they do. And the resulting stories are about the broken relationships and violence that results. Yeah, this promise creates huge problems. Now everyone has to protect themselves and fight for survival, and they're all using death as this weapon to gain power. It all leads to a story about the building of the city of Babylon. Or in Hebrew, Babel. Everyone comes together to elevate themselves to the place of God. And God knows how devastating this could be. A whole culture redefining good and evil as if they are God. So God confuses their language and scatters them. Now from here on, Babylon becomes like an icon in the biblical story. It's an image that represents humanity's corporate rebellion against God. And the next time we see it is in the story of ancient Egypt. Yeah, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he feels threatened by these immigrant Israelites. He starts killing all of the boys, enslaving the rest. And this is really evil. Yeah, Egypt's like this bigger, badder Babylon. They take care of themselves at the expense of others by redefining evil as good. And so God turns Pharaoh's evil back on him. His pride drives him forward, and he's swallowed up by death. Now, after this great deliverance, the Israelites sing a song about how God is their warrior who liberated them from evil. And the Israelites referred to this moment as the day. The day they were rescued from a corrupt human system. And every year since then, the Israelites have celebrated the day of their liberation with this symbolic meal of a sacrificial lamb that's called Passover. Eventually, Israel comes into its own land, have their own kings, and they face new enemies. So that past day of the Lord, celebrated every Passover, begins to generate hope that God will bring the day again to save Israel from new threats. Now, out in the hills was a sheep herder named Amos. He was appointed by God as a prophet to announce shocking news to Israel, that God was bringing another day of the Lord against his enemies, and this time the target is Israel. What? Sadly, Israel's leaders had also redefined good and evil for themselves, resulting in corruption and violence. So God's people have become like Babylon, the oppressed become oppressors. Babylon seems like a trap no one can escape. And so the day of the Lord comes upon Israel. They're conquered, taken captive into exile. And from then on, Israel suffered under the rule of continuous oppressive empires. This is the story Jesus was born into. Yeah, in his day, the oppressive empire over Israel is Rome. So is Jesus going to confront Rome, take him out? Well, no. Jesus saw the real enemy as that mysterious, unhuman evil. The evil that's lured Babylon, Egypt, Rome, Israel, all humanity has given in to evil's promise of power. This is what Jesus resisted alone in the wilderness when he was tempted to exploit his power for self-interest. But he didn't. And after that, he started to confront the effects of evil on others. Yeah, he started saying that he was going to Jerusalem for Passover for a final showdown to confront the evil of Israel and Rome by 
dying. Dying? I mean, that feels like losing. Jesus was going to let evil exhaust all of its power on him, using its only real weapon, death. Jesus knew that God's love and life were even more powerful, that he could overcome evil by becoming the Passover lamb, giving his life in an act of love. And something changed that day. When Jesus defeated evil, he opened up a new way for anyone to escape from Babylon and discover this new kind of power, this new way of being human. Okay, so something changed. But the power of evil is still alive and well. and We keep building new versions of Babylon. Right. And so the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, points to the future and final day of the Lord. It's when God's kingdom comes to confront Babylon the Great, this image of all the corrupt nations of the world. Yeah, this is it. Armageddon. Final judgment. How is Jesus going to finish off evil? Well, that's not how you'd expect. In the Revelation, the victorious Jesus is symbolized by a sacrificial bloody lamb. And then when Jesus does arrive in the end, riding his white horse to confront evil, he's bloody before the battle even starts. Pre-bloodied? That's a strange image. Yeah, it's because Jesus isn't out for our blood. Rather, he overcame with his blood when he died for his enemies. And the sword is in his mouth. It's a symbol of Jesus' authority to define good and evil and hold us accountable when he brings final justice once and for all. And so, in the meantime, the day of the Lord is an invitation to resist the culture of Babylon. And it's a promise that God will one day free our world from corruption and bring about the new things that he has in store. Thanks for watching The Bible Project. I thought that was uh, an interesting survey of what was going on. But again, we're asking the question, if the day of the Lord is good, why? Because the day of the Lord is when God establishes justice in earth. I, I put it this way, when the good king shows up as the good judge, that is good news. It, as humans, you've seen it. You've seen injustice. You're like, of course I've seen injustice. I've been in high school. I know. It, it, it hurts to be here. It hurts to be in this wicked system when people are allowed to do wickedness on one another. And we yearn and ache for, man, there has to be, if only we could get the right person in charge, then maybe we could finally fix things. And that is true, and Jesus is that one. I've talked about it before, but it's like that moment when in Lord of the Rings when Aragon is finally king, when we finally have the one that we've been waiting for, someone is going to do justice in the land. That's what we look forward to in the day of the Lord. When God establishes the good king, being a good judge is good news. Secondly, this invitation to come to him now and be spared the just penalty of your sins is very good news. God is willing to forgive us. God is willing to spare us. He is warning of this coming day of the Lord. If we remember back even in the book of Zephaniah to the beginning of chapter 2, he invited those that were humble and willing to come and obey and seek refuge in him that they might be spared on the day of the Lord. We spoke in the book of Hebrews how we now have this awesome offering from Jesus that if we come to him, we can find refuge from the coming judgment, which would justly fall on us if we stay in the path of God's wrath. And the incredible thing is that what God hopes to accomplish through his judgment is good. Last week, we began by spoke, speaking about Noah. And thinking of that time when wickedness was all throughout the earth, I had this thought this week that God could have rightly chosen to destroy the whole earth at that time. But, but however, He didn't. He did something better than that. He saved for Himself a remnant to rebuild the earth. And in the last days, I think God, it's true, God could rightly destroy every single one of us because of our wickedness. Every living soul, and He would be right. Everyone that has sinned against Him, God could rightly punish, but instead He did something even better than that. He made a way of escape. He invited those who would come to him to be saved and made new. He, found, he made a way so that without their own death, they can be transformed into the kind of beings that can one day exist in the good world God wanted to make and not ruin it and not destroy one another and truly have the relationship with God that he wanted to have from the beginning. So what do we do? Knowing that this, this is true, if you are in Jesus, if you are a Christian with a Godward hope, we don't blush or apologize for this part of our faith. This is a good news thing. This is God will someday 
establish justice on the earth. God will someday right the wrongs. Sometimes um, my wife and I probably both consume too much news, but sometimes they'd be stressed out about what's going on on the global scale and who's ever going to right all of these wrongs. This is what we look to as our hope. Not a political victory, not a military victory, but someday God who has seen every nation will judge. Someday God will set the record straight. Someday God will establish justice. And that God is so good that rather than destroying the whole earth as he could, he's made a way of escape. He's made a way that somebody could know him. So our encouragement to you as we consider the book of Zephaniah is be ready for the day of the Lord so that it can truly be good news for you. How do we do that? Well, it... it, is interesting when he's speaking of Judah in verse 7 of the chapter that we were looking at, he says this, he said, I thought you would certainly fear me and accept correction. He hints at what the life of a person who's responding rightly, one who God is sparing, would look like. And it's one who fears God and accepts his discipline of saying, God, you know better than me. God, you can correct me. God, I am not the one that's all right. You are the one that is right in all that you do, and I need to be changed. God wanted to do this with Israel, and instead they wanted to corrupt all of their deeds. But you have a different invitation. You have an opportunity tonight to say, hey, the day of the Lord is coming. And you know what? America is not going to stand in that day. There is not a land, including this one, especially this one someday, that we would not rightly be consumed by the wrath of God if He were to visit us. And there's not a life of a person that said, well, yeah, you know, but I'm not that bad. We don't understand the holiness of God and the ways that we've violated God's law, how serious that they are. But God invites you just like he did to the people of Israel. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. He says, without shame, gather together before this decree takes a place and seek the Lord. Before the Lord's anger overtakes you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes, seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth. You who carry out his commands, seek righteousness and seek humility. You can come to God today. That's a huge thing that you can do. Be do. This is a, something that we have to talk to you about. This is what we want to be honest about the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible sees the wickedness of man and says, I will judge that someday. And you and I will be rightly judged by it. So if you haven't decided what you're going to do with the cross, if you haven't decided what you're going to do on the, for, with Jesus, the day of the Lord is not good news for you if you've rejected the Son. If you have, the day of the Lord is great news and great hope. And there's people who desperately need to be warned about it and be made ready for it. You are like Noah before the flood. And you know God has made a way of escape that you know about. And you know where the door is to the ark. Who will you warn? Who will you help be ready? Many will ignore you, but somebody just might get on the boat. Somebody might just be safe. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the word of the Lord, your word, God and Zephaniah. I pray that you would tune our hearts to sing your praise, that you would train our hearts and our affections, our sensibilities, that we can know that you are so good that everything that you do is good, that we can be ready with our yes and amen to worship you for the goodness of what you're going to do, including your coming judgment on the earth. Lord, I pray that we would really hate wickedness and evil and love righteousness like you do, God. And would you help us see more clearly why your coming judgment is good news for the earth? Because, Lord, this earth is such a terrible place to be because we have made it so terrible. In our wickedness and our sin, we have harmed and destroyed one another. And God, because you are good, you must stand up. You must judge. You must even judge us. But I thank you that your justice met your love and your mercy as well, and that you, you sent the Savior so that there can be a way of escape, God. We thank you for that, and we look forward for that, the day when you will come back as judge and set all things right, and that we can be spared, and we can await your ultimate fulfillment of your good in the earth, where you tear down the wicked nations of the earth. No matter how powerful they were, God, they will not stand on the last day. We will only stand if we have sided with you. So today, I pray that everybody in here would be ready, that if they haven't joined your family yet, they would cry out to you to be saved, And if we have kept our mouths closed, that we would open up our mouths and like Zephaniah, cry out to the world, the day of the Lord's judgment is coming. Be ready. Be saved. Trust in the Lord while he may be found. May that be the constant cry of our lips. May we love people enough to share this news with them. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.